Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today, Aspen Brain Institute is launching our new Expert Series 2.0. Welcome to our growing community of 21st century global seekers seeking to be educated and delighted at the cutting edge. And hello to people all over the US and to 103 different countries who have registered for this series. Thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate it. Uh, we're offering our new free series so that we can build a global online community focused on brain health. We'd like to thank uh, Lugano Diamonds for their generous support as our national underwriter. We also thank Lugano Diamonds for choosing Aspen Brain Institute as a nonprofit worthy of their values and their goals. And also for making our Zoom expert series free and available to the public and able to be viewed free worldwide. So thanks again to Lugano Diamonds. We also thank Alpine Bank for their generous support and sponsorship over many years now. We also thank our friends at Brain Futures who are translating science to advance human potential. And one more, we thank our friends at the American Federation for Research on Aging. At our expert, series today, you will hear global seekers, sorry, global leaders, deep thinkers, technology experts, cutting edge scientists, top notch doctors, and extraordinary creatives. We hope their insights will transform how you care for your brain today that your 80 year old brain will thank you for. This uh, expert series 2.0 underscores Aspen Brain Institute's mission to share access to the top minds and evidence-based research on brain health to increase brain health literacy globally and ultimately to create a brain healthy planet. So it is my honor and privilege to bring you these new episodes today Let's see what we can learn and examine together. And now to our expert series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenda. And Dr. Bill Hazeltine, I am so grateful for your being here again today. The audience is looking forward to your presentation. Um, Bill, as most of you already know, has had an active career in science, business, and philanthropy. He was a professor at Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health. He was founder and chair of the Division of Biochemical Pharmacology and the Division of Human Retrovirology. He's known for his pioneering work on cancer, HIV AIDS, and now COVID and genomics, and founded 12 biotech companies, has written several books, most recently two that all of you watching today will want to look at, A Family Guide to COVID and A COVID Back to School Guide. He has a new autobiography coming out in October. One of my favorite books that he wrote is called World Class, A Story of Adversity, Transformation, and Success at NYU Langone Health. And hopefully some of those uh, tidbits will be useful as we do this today. Um, I also think that you will be a future Nobel Prize laureate. I'm waiting for that call that you get in the middle, early in the morning, it will happen. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I want to start by asking you you know, we talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic, and now the fourth R might be resilience. Talk to us about what you think everyone needs to know and do during the pandemic. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I think it was about 14 years ago when the, uh, maybe the first or second uh, 
Aspen Ideas Festival. My brother and I were asked to help put together a program running over two weeks on the brain. And I don't know if many of you remember that, but it was a lot of fun. And what we decided uh, to do, and my brother is an expert on the brain from several different perspectives, a PhD in neuroscience, amongst other things, uh, is focus on why you're you and why you're so special. We thought that would be a great topic for the audience that attends the Aspen Festival, because of course they think they're hot stuff. <laughs> and uh, it was really fun because we went from sort of the outside in. How do you measure what's going inside the brain? What do you find when you do that? Uh, and then going into really personal feelings and issues. And for me, the high point was when we had a famous reporter who'd been severely injured in Afghanistan. You may remember that. And uh, had been in a coma, he lost part of his brain. And we had a long, very deep conversation with him about who he was before and after the event. It was really a very deep dive, very moving dive into what a person is, and what their perception of themselves are. Maybe the most poignant moment when he described how his five-year-old daughter taught him how to talk again, mm. sat on his bed and taught him how to talk. Uh, it was an amazing, amazing uh, seminar. And it was, it was just a lot of fun. And I think what you're doing by introducing these concepts of what's happening inside our brain, how we know it, how we're measuring it, is, is tremendously important because we ourselves are interested in ourselves and our brain is very much what we are. And brain health is something that's generally not understood particularly well, not paid attention to by people until it's probably too late. And so I wanna commend you to begin with for this series and uh, what you're doing. So to get back to the question you asked, resilience. Uh, it's probably one of our most important traits. You know, I've been thinking a lot about evolution from a virus's point of view. And one of the things that is uh, interesting about this virus, or any virus, is they're code crackers. We now understand machine intelligence is throwing a lot of random combinations at a problem and coming up with a really interesting solution. That's what viruses are doing. Trillions of times a day, they're trying to crack the human code. And when you look at COVID, it's adapted to modern humanity. There are a lot of us, we move around, we are in tight knit groups, we have great social inequities and the bottom of the pyramid is great for them. And it's cracked our political code, the American political code. Very frightening to think that a virus could be that smart. It couldn't crack China's, but it sure as hell cracked ours. Now, what do we have that they don't? We know how powerful machine intelligence is, and we know it can beat a chess master. It can beat a go master. It can even outfight a jet pilot. You just did it. Five to zero. Pretty scary if you're a jet pilot up there and thinking your adversary is not a a Russian or a Chinese or Indian, it's a uh, AI out to get you. And you've just lost five to zero. What do we have? Well, nature has evolved something else. Essentially what the virus is doing is adapted to circumstance. Our intelligence allows us to adapt quickly, sometimes within minutes or hours of a new situation, sometimes days or weeks or months, but through intelligence, it's a very powerful new kind of intelligence and adaptation. It's an evolutionary advantage. Why are we so more successful than other species? We can adapt within a lifetime. And we can even adapt within a fraction of a lifetime to adverse circumstance. That's resilience. That's what resilience is. It's the ability through our emotions and our intellect to adapt to new realities. I'll give you a personal story. I grew up in a remote desert community. My dad was a weapon scientist. So those of you who know China Lake, California, know it's in the middle of nowhere. I once flew with some friends on the jet 
and said, hey, go over by China Lake. And we couldn't get there because it's restricted airspace. But I said, we could get close enough. And I said, look, when I was planning to bicycle in Europe, I would practice by bicycling from there to there, from where we lived to the end of Death Valley and back. It was about 40 miles. And some guy looked at me and said, oh, you mean from nowhere to nowhere? Well, you know, that is uh, a, a very interesting place to have grown up. And what I did when I left there was adapt to a completely different environment. And I thought to myself, I'm never gonna go back. I'm not gonna live in the countryside. Cities are for me, Boston, New York, Washington, Paris, Tokyo, uh, those are cities I've lived in, and a few more big cities. Where am I speaking to you from? A farm I bought in Connecticut. Oh, nice. Why? Because I've adapted to COVID. I'm resilient, <laughs> okay? I never thought I would be here, and by the way, I'm happy as a clam. I've got my close family all around me, and what's happened to families? Families are renewed, rejuvenated. There's a resilience to the family structure and we begin to realize why we have families. We have families to protect ourselves. Now, most of us know that, but we don't experience it as acutely as we do right now. And so as we think about what's happening to ourselves and to society as a result of the pressure that COVID has put on us, particularly in America, we have adapted. Let me give you one other example of adaptation and resiliency. I have offices in Beijing and Shanghai. And in November, I was in Wuhan. And I have a lot of friends in Wuhan, and I have the head of my foundation is from Wuhan. So I was in touch with them on a really close daily basis during the beginning of this. It was awful, it was like New York. My head of my foundation lost three grandparents in three weeks. Mm. What is my office there like today? They're back to work for over a month in office. They go out to restaurants, they go to theaters, they go to big parties, they go to performances with hundreds of people and they're not worried. China has adapted, we have not. China has proven to be resilient, we have not. You might ask yourself, why, how, how could it be that we're where we are as a country when we have all the knowledge? They're not doing anything different from what we could do, but they are doing something very substantially different. On a day when we have 50,000 people sick, they have five diagnosed. A day when we have 1,500 people dead, and we have had those days, they have none. And the first thing everybody says to me is, you can't believe their numbers. Well, guess what? I believe my friends who are leading normal lives without masks, without fear. That's what I believe. And you should ask yourself, who's telling you not to believe what's going on over there? And why is it, if they can do all that through their resilience, why can't we? So that's a, a long answer to a short question. It's a beautiful answer and it's important to think about adapting and survival of the fittest. And I think like you, we've all changed our behavior to, well, that's not fair. Like you, all of those that are watching today have changed their behavior to help with this virus. I know that there are seven varieties of coronavirus that infect humans. Four give us the sniffles. One causes a deadly disease smoldering in the Middle East since 2012, and two have erupted into full-time pandemics. The first caused SARS, and it petered out quickly. The other causes COVID-19, and it has hobbled us. Why the difference, and how can you help us understand that? Um, again, let's go back to being a virus. Okay. A friend of mine actually uh, has just written a very nice series, Arthur Amon, some of you may know him. Uh, we worked together to create Amphar many years ago. Um, and he's just publishing a series on conversations with the virus, three viruses. 
the flu virus of 1958, which got me, okay. HIV AIDS, which didn't get me, and COVID, which so far hasn't got me, okay? But uh, he, he's engaging in direct conversations, and they're not too far different from the description I gave of a code cracker. So let's take the four cold viruses. They've been with humanity for a very long time. They don't bother us particularly. We get colds, we don't like them, but they don't kill us, except they do kill us. They kill us about one out of, uh, let's say 10,000 times. They give us the same disease we see with COVID. So at the far margins, they are nasty. And by the way, that's true for many things we dismiss. If you look at the far edge, they can be really nasty, like other cold viruses from different families. But for the most part, they don't. But they have a particular ecological niche, and it's one we really have to pay attention to right now. If you think about the childhood viruses, measles, polio, mumps, uh, chicken pox, get it, and you're protected for life. But are you protected from life for colds? No, you get the same colds over and over and over again. That's because coronaviruses have got a different trick. Their trick is get it and forget it. You get it, you get over it quickly, and you forget it quickly and it comes right back unchanged the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. That's what's wrong with the idea of herd immunity. There are two things wrong with herd immunity. First of all, for America, it would mean 3 million dead if you just let it roll, 3 million dead. That's assuming it's only 1% lethal, okay? That's the first thing to say. I don't think we want that. The second thing is it doesn't exist. This virus keeps coming back. And now we were a little uncertain whether COVID-2 would do that because we didn't have the data, but now we're, that data is pouring in. We're finding people by fingerprinting the virus they had and the new virus they get, that yeah, a new virus gets them, sometimes within four weeks of their first clearance, short. So I think we're about to see a new wave of a bunch of people who thought they were better who are now getting infected with a different virus. So they don't go away. And when you look at these four viruses, the first ones you mentioned, and there are maybe a couple more we haven't found yet, they come back every year and they come back, you know, seasonally, come back along with the flu. And so that's the first thing to say. Now the other two, the other three, the first two, MERS and SARS, hadn't fully cracked our code in the sense that they were far too lethal. They didn't have a long asymptomatic period. And what they did is they got you and either one out of 10 or one out of three died and you died pretty fast, and you were sick right away. So you didn't have time to spread it around. This virus, my guess now is it only makes people sick about two or 3% of the time. We miss, because we only test the worried and the ill, we miss about 90% of those people are actually spreading the virus. So let's say three people out of 100 get sick. That's great for the virus because it means they can, it can spread like crazy. This is a well-adapted virus from the virus point of view. From our point of view, it's not so great, especially if you're older, because the way it works is it's only knocking off the old. Now, if this were a virus that occurred 150 years ago, we wouldn't care so much about that because there were very few people over 70. And it would be great for them. Right now, we're putting all our scientific tools to try to shut it down. I think we will but it's gonna to be tougher than people think. So uh, that's kind of a short version of looking at what these viruses are and how they work. What do you think we should be doing about testing and what are your thoughts on vaccines? I know with your experience with HIV AIDS, we never got one. I know the audience would love to hear what you think about that. Well, I was just on the uh, phone with uh, Kamala Harris and Chris Murphy. Good. And uh, the question I asked, it was a fundraiser, and it was a very successful fundraiser. Uh, the question I asked the, to begin with is, and I didn't have to answer what is your plan because what part of the spiel is what their plan is. 
I didn't mm -hmm. like it. Okay. Because what I wanted them to, I wanted to hear, and the question that I then asked was, how are you going to convince you, the American voter, that your plan is better than Trump's? And the answer wasn't a good answer, in my view. I mean, who am I? I'm just telling you, I didn't like the answer. And the reason I didn't like the answer is the answer was, we're going to use the full power of the federal government to combat this disease. And we're going to uh, do massive testing, and we're going to do massive contact tracing, and we're going to uh, do a few other things, help you know, equip schools. Those are all good answers. But are those answers that the average voter wants to hear? No. I don't think so. What I said, what I, I'm just right now, before I got this call, I'm writing to some people I know at the top of the campaign saying, hey, you guys got to get a better answer here. The answer is, we're going to fix what Trump broke. We have a plan that's going to stop this and get you back to work in three months. Whether or not we have a vaccine or a new drug, we will do it. And this is what we're going to do. And now I'm getting to your answer. Thank you. Okay. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make sure that every American household has enough free tests, like pregnancy tests, that you mm -hmm. can use saliva. You'll have an answer within 15 minutes for everybody who goes to work or goes to school to test themselves every day. We're going to know who's contagious. And then we are going to make sure that those who are contagious have the assistance they need to stay isolated until they're free and no longer contagious. That's simple, it's direct, it's clear, and by the way, it's correct. Okay? So that is all you need to say. That's a message, and that's actually what I believe we can do without a vaccine, without a drug. And what's the difference between what we did and what they can do today and what the Chinese did? I've studied in great detail and I've just written a piece for the Daily Cloud on comparing what we did, what we can do, and what the, Ch no, what the Chinese did, what we did, and what we can do. The Chinese controlled the epidemic by assuming everybody who was exposed was contagious. That's nothing we even began to consider. We think about that. Everybody exposed is considered to be contagious. So if you are on an airplane and one person on that plane was infected, everybody is quarantined. If you're in an apartment building and one or two people are infected, the whole building is quarantined. That's how they did it. They have other things that they did, but it wasn't testing, contact tracing, uh, testing. In fact, my friend who was on one of those planes never was tested, it's been 14 days. It's kind of like if you come in from abroad, you have to stay 14 days isolated here even. That's what it's like, but for the whole country. And that's what did it, plus the discipline to do it. And there's a few other things they did, but that's basically what they did. We probably can't do that because we have so many people infected. But with a rapid home test, we can identify the contagions. And we don't have to contact trace because we already know who's contagious. That's what we can do with new technology. And then the hard part, is they use our social and medical services for making it possible and for people, no matter what their economic circumstances are, to be isolated. So we pay them if they need to be paid. We provide housing if they're homeless. We do whatever is necessary to keep them out of circulation and well-treated for a period of about seven to 10 days. And that's all it takes. So it's pretty simple, not easy to do, but it's pretty simple. And it's a message I think that people can understand. I hope I can get that message through to the Biden campaign. So when you hear people ask the question, they say, we're going to fix what Trump broke and we're going to get you back to work within three months. That's what I hope they say. That sounds great. How long do you think it'll be before we have those free rapid home tests? We could have had them now if we had any. Uh, any real effort to get them. They exist. Um, you may have read about the new ABBA test. It's a $5 test that uses saliva and takes 15, 20 minutes to do. We now know a couple of things. What do we know? Let me tell you the elements that we know now that we didn't know a few months ago. The first thing we know is you're only contagious for a short period of time. Between day two 
and day 11. You may have evidence of RNA in your body, but you don't spread the virus. There's no virus you can get. There's RNA there, but there's no virus. So the test we're using is the wrong test. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And you're only contagious for a short time. And an antigen test, and to be contagious, you have to have a lot of virus, enough for an antigen test to pick up, which is not as sensitive as the PCR test. But it's sensitive enough, sensitive enough to pick up people who are contagious. That's the first uh, thing uh, that we know uh, that's uh, important. Second level, we now have those tests. The second thing we know is it's easier and more reliable to measure virus in saliva than it is in the nasopharynx. Just after spit, you don't have to have, shove anything up your nose. And it's a lot more virus there, by the way. And there's new papers that just came out last week that compare nasooropharynx swabs to saliva tests in a large number of people, and saliva beats it hands down. More virus, more reliable, easier to sample. So those are two big steps forward. Now, Abbott's come up with a thing. It looks like a little card. I know how much it costs Egypt to use those cards to do a serology test, which is basically the same thing. They tested 68 million people using the American Abbott test, and it cost them 50 cents a test. The real cost of manufacture is five cents mm -hmm. or less. It's easy to make, and it's, you just like printing. You can print the darn things. So you can make enough. I guess about 100 million a day for everybody to use who goes to work or goes to school. And you only actually have to do it every other day. That's the other thing we know. You can model everything so you don't have to test yourself every day. You can reduce transmission by about 95% if everybody tests themselves every other day. You put those three together and you've got a great recipe for control. There's a couple of other little things I would do, like just to be sure I was catching everybody. I would test the wastewater of all the schools and, and office buildings and know which building might have a uh, problem because wastewater testing works pretty well. By the way, it's not new. It's been used in the Disney parks for about 20 years to see if they have any potential threats. A friend of mine was, amongst other things, uh, involved in wastewater testing in the Disney parks. And I, I heard somewhere that some school system recently, they found COVID in the wastewater and cut, sh shut down the schools, so. Yeah, that's right. That's a good indication that it's there. And by the way, you can do it for flu and for other viruses too. How, yeah. how are we gonna keep these people that won't even wear their masks from doing the free daily tests and then isolating f from days two to 12 if they're contagious? Uh, I think, first of all, you make it attractive. And for those people who need it, you make it economically attractive. You know, I think with the right leadership, and this is where leadership comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people, I don't need to tell the Aspen Institute about leadership. That's how I was introduced to the Aspen Institute. I took a leadership course when I was moving from academia to business. And I took three or four courses. And I can say the one that I took at Aspen was so much superior to anything else. Why? Because they focused on values mm -hmm. of leadership. They didn't talk about your psychology or the techniques or anything else. They talked about what is the value of, what value should you have as a leader? So it was deeply, deeply focused on values. And that is the foundation of the Aspen Institute. That's how it whole thing started. And it's a very, I mean, it's a deep and wonderful tradition. And I, it was privileged be part of it. And some of the people I met in that 15-day uh, course have remained friends for life. It was a wonderful experience uh, uh, for me. But with leadership, you need, you need clarity, not confusion, which we see. You need consistency. You have to hear the same message over and over again. And you need uh, uh, you need knowledge. The people have to have knowledge. It has, they have to be credible. They can't keep changing the story to adapt to this or that. If change is needed, you have to admit it and say, we were wrong, now we're going to do this. But it's, 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 and there's another C that's really important, and that's compassion. A leader has to show compassion, has to be compassionate, and has to show compassion. 
because people need help. You know, how many people are crying out for leadership? You know, when I wrote the book on back to school, I interviewed a lot of people. The most common question is, tell me what to do. That's what people were crying for. You know, grandparents want to know it like me, but parents, you know, when I talk to the mothers of my grandchildren, my goodness, they are saying, please tell us what to do. I can't tell you what to do. You have to figure out what to do, given your circumstances and where you are, et cetera. But I can give you a guide. But leadership is really important in uh, this. It's got to be clear, consistent, credible, and compassionate. And we fail on all four scores. Now, as it happens, other countries have failed too. But some of them have done a bit better than us because they have governance, which is another focus of two organizations I'm involved in. One is Aspen and the other is Brookings. You need governance. You need a, a, a system of governance. You, have a, you need a public health service, which has real functional capacities, not one that says, this is what you should do. And if you're a state, you can do it or not do it, right? That's not what we need. That's not how other countries got through with pretty poor leadership, I might say, some of the other countries. They actually had a functioning public health uh, system. And then to your point, you need to have a population which is, I would say, has a sense of solidarity. And we in America have been short on solidarity, not always, but sometimes we fail in the solidarity test. And we have a leader who is fragmenting whatever solidarity we had, doing his best to smash it to bits. And so those three things is what we need. And it's the last one that we need to focus on. What is social responsibility? But I think that if we help people, like we help the homeless, we help the, who do we actually need to help? Do we need to help? We, we need to help, let's say, the Lat Latino and black worker in our urban slums. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that need the help. You know, I'm here in Connecticut. Nobody needs to help me, right? Except I have to help myself. But the people who have to go to work or starve, we have to help them. And if they get COVID, we have to help them be isolated. We have to make sure they get the money they need, they get the help they need, they get the support for their family. If there's a kid, you can't send the kid to some cage in the southern border or wherever you're going to send him. You got to isolate the whole family. That means isolate the, even the wage earners. You got to take care of them too. So it's Easy to say, hard to do, especially hard to do with the systems that we currently have in place. My hope is if we learn how to do that for COVID, we can do that for other big problems like the elderly and some other problems that we have that are chronic. That would be great. And that sounds like another book in your- in, in Before your already on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder if it would help you know, everybody gets chicken pox, right? And some people get shingles, which is the reactivation of that virus. Would it help? Would it be a big aha for at least the US to remind people of that? And here we are with COVID. And so please do what you're supposed to do, get tested every day or every other day, and then isolate when you're infected. I think that would be a good message to give. You know, I hope you're going to ask me some questions about the brain. I have a few things to say about the brain and COVID, if you're interested. Uh, yes, we're going to do that right now. We're going from reading, writing, arithmetic, and resilience, Pat's clarity, consistency, credibility, and compassion <laughs> to the brain. So let's talk about what this virus does to the brain. The good news, insofar as we know, is it doesn't infect the nervous system directly. Mm -hmm. So how in the world do you lose your sense of smell? It was not infecting your nervous system. That's a good question, so people have asked it. And it turns out, little did you know, you have a sustenacular cell in your olfactory organ. I didn't know that, but I found it out. And what the virus does, it attacks that cell. Now what's interesting about that is it doesn't kill the neuron, and because sustenacular cells can regenerate quickly, you get your sense of smell back within, I would say, about 
two weeks for most people because the neurons are still there and active. The same thing for taste. Although people, as far as I've found so far, haven't actually done the detailed biology to understand why taste goes. There must be a sustenacular-like cell. So that's the first thing. And it doesn't, it, you, you don't get, you don't see virus in, the, in the, the neurons in the brain. So that's good. That's not to say that this disease doesn't cause serious brain damage. At least 20% of people who have serious disease and survive an episode in the ICU come out with brain deficits. Mm -hmm. Some of those are going to be lifelong. The first thing that causes those deficits are massive strokes. And the reason for that is the mid phase of this disease is hypercoagulation. And hypercoagulation means you get massive clots. They can plug up in your veins and arteries, which is unusual, by the way. They can plug up your femoral vein and cause a leg amputation like the actor had, arm amputation, finger amputations. But those big, big clots can go everywhere. They can kill you by giving you a lung embolus, a heart attack, a major ischemic incident in your brain. Or more likely, what happens in many is microclots. Now, some of you may be familiar with what heart-lung machines do, and that is they produce a lot of clots, little clots. So they sort of give you fuzzy brain, at least until your brain adapts after about a year. That's why they say if you've ever been in a heart-lung machine, don't make a big decision, at least for a year, because your brain isn't functioning very well. Well, this throws up big clots and little clots in a lot of people. And so you're seeing their lungs are filled with microemboli, hearts, and kidneys. And that's one kind of damage, and it's pretty prevalent. We're learning to manage it. Maybe not all the clots, but certainly the big clots. The second thing that can happen is there's a part of your brain called the corpus callosum, which connects the two halves of your brain. It's kind of a bunch of uh, wires that go across. There's a thicker part of that called the splenium, and it first showed up in kids, four kids in Chicago who got the hyper uh, inflammatory disease. Four out of four had discernible lesions in the splenium of the corpus callosum. And I've talked to three or four neurobiologists or neuroscientists and neurologists about that. And it's not directly infecting that part of the brain, but what it, the way it shows up is ataxia. You can't get normal motion. You may have a little bit of aphasia. Uh, you may feel confused. Your IQ score is a lot lower than it used to be uh, before this. Um, and what it probably is, is inflammation of the capillaries that feed that part of the brain. Now, we don't know how well children and adults recover. Children seem to recover pretty well. We're learning that recovery of the adult, especially the older adult, is slower, but we don't have enough time to know uh, how serious that will be. That's the beginning of the brain injury, but there's another part of this disease which affects the patients and people who aren't patients. That's us, hopefully most of us. And it's given the country the equivalent of post-traumatic stress disorder. The issue is, it's not post. It's traumatic stress disorder. And there are many indications that that's happening on a really big scale. Why do I say that? If you look and you do comparisons, and the magazines are now, the scientific literature is now getting filled with this, you see anxiety, 40, 50%. Depression, 40, 50%. That's pretty high. You see drug use going up substantially from what was already high, and you see an increasing wave of suicides, not just in our cities, but in our rural communities as well. All those are associated with post-traumatic stress disorder. The whole country is going through something like traumatic stress. And as I say, it's not exactly post. It's here today. For example, there was recently an article on comparing what a mother feels right now to postpartum depression, a mother of young children making decisions about going to school. There are huge uncertainties. 
on one hand, she knows she has a responsibility to educate her children. On another hand, how am I going to risk these kids, these most precious part of my life, especially the one that had a heart operation when he was two days old, right? I mean, these are real situations. What are those mothers thinking and going through? What are those fathers uh, thinking about? And so it's a hugely powerful stress. I've come up to real, I've come to realize there's another kind of stress that I have felt. And I came about it kind of in an odd way. I was reading a report of a theater group in, in uh, New York that grow, was inspired by one aspect of post-traumatic stress disorder in the military. And it's called moral injury, moral injury. And their reading of that is that the experience that many soldiers go through, and this goes all the way back to antiquity and how the Greeks with a cathartic process worked on similar problems, that a soldier will witness things, not just in the normal battles, but they'll w witness truly inhuman amoral acts, which occur in war, which they know to be wrong because every human has an intrinsic sense of moral right and wrong. And they will see their leaders do terrible things that, they, that violate, in the deepest sense, what they believe to be right and wrong. And all militaries know that they have to care or should care for that aspect of their soldier. And especially today, when we focus on so many people who are returning to a society that is basically at peace, and they have this cognitive issue of knowing and seeing their authority figures do vile things. They themselves may also have been in totally inhuman acts like slaughtering women and children in an Afghan village, or at least standing by and watching it happen, or seeing a helicopter gunship wipe out a, a elementary school. Those things happen, those aren't made up. It violates them and they have, a, it's an intrinsic and rather important part of post-traumatic stress disorder. When I witness what our government is doing, I feel morally injured. They are exacerbating. I've actually said a little bit hyperbolically that the virus's best friend is in our White House. Oh dear. If you were to do something to spread this virus, you would do what we are doing. And it's not just one person. It's a group of people that support those people. We in America are injuring ourselves. And we're injuring us not only physically, we're injuring ourselves mentally. And so when you look at the recovery period from this epidemic, I hope we learn it's not just the disease, the physical body that has been injured. It is our morality that's been injured and it's our psyche that's been injured. And we have to focus on that kind of re repair as well. That's really beautifully stated. Um, what are you personally doing to deal with the post-traumatic stress, if you will, of this virus and what recommendations do you have for the audience? Well, you know, I've always, I've always, and actually I have two overperforming siblings, let's put it this way. <laughs> when people ask me, how did that happen? A brother and a sister. I'll give you an idea. My sister got a tenure job at University of Texas at age 76. Talk oh, about overperforming, awesome. right? And she's going strong, doing all sorts of things. My brother has been at the top of a number of different organizations. Uh, they, I, they say, what happened to you three? I say, well, they parents wound us up so tightly, like a little doll we're still unwinding. It's mm -hmm. like that energizing buddy. But there's a deeper answer to that. And the way I've always coped with stress is work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have just dived into work. No matter what the stress is, stress in marriage, stress in health, stress in the Vietnam War, stress, you name it. I happen to be very fortunate because all the skills I've acquired 
which are molecular biology, virology, drug development, business, uh, government, business government interaction, health systems, happen to fit the needs. So I'm working 18 hours a day. I'm trying to understand and help other people understand what's happening. And so I'm getting, you know, I'm consulting to a number of different governments, uh, trying to help uh, them, a number of different businesses. Many of my scientific grandchildren are working with me on all sorts of ideas. You know, so whether, it, whether it's science, whether it's companies, whether it's uh, a government policy, uh, I have some viewpoint based on my life's experience. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I work 18 hours a day. I get up at six, I go to bed about 10 uh, every day uh, working on this. I now have, you know, I just bought two puppies. I have a farm. I go whack some bushes if I feel too stressed out. Uh, stuff I haven't done for many, many years. Uh, but that's how I cope with it. Uh, I think each of us has our own ways. But I had a very rare opportunity to have dinner with uh, a couple of friends. And they don't have those outlets. They're very worldly. They, you know, were in near sort of New York, New Yorkers. They would go out six nights a week. They are been the head of major global foundations, all sorts of things. They are not feeling so good. They're in their apartment, you know, and I'd say, hey, come on, I've got a country place. Maybe you ought to think about that. Oh, no, the world's been our country. Well, that was my country. I would travel three or four months a year, and my wife would say, how about a country place, Bill? I'd say, are you crazy? We're going to Africa, we're going to Borneo, we're going to Rwanda in the next three months, and why the heck should we have a country place? Well, this time she said, hey, you know, maybe we should have a country place. Hmm, <laughs> sounds good. So I think there's different ways that people can adapt. But I think, I would say one thing that is a wonderful experience, and as you get older, you appreciate the cycle of life more. You appreciate the fact that things grow. You appreciate the fact that trees are beautiful and you can save them by cutting off the strangling vines, the stra you know, strangling vines. Those are things that make you feel good. And so uh, it's kind of back to the, it, it's sort of Voltaire, cultivate your own garden, uh, whatever that garden may be. Um, there's a lot more time we have now to think, you know, rather than to travel, to go to work. I'll just tell you that my foundation is something that's working very well for the foundation, is that all the finances are in great shape because people aren't going back and forth through Delhi traffic to get where they have to go. They have about three or four more hours a day to work. So everything's working perfectly well, at least there. And that's true for some businesses as well. So I'd say you, everybody has to find their own way to cope with the traumatic stress we're going through. So for others, I think exercise and mindfulness, and like you said, cultivate your own garden, cook more. Mm -hmm. um, Glenda is back on, and I know we have uh, lots of questions from the audience. And oh, by the way, Bill, I think some of your Aspen Institute friends are participating today. And we're so grateful for everybody that's joined us for this Good. session. Glenda, do you want to take the lead now? And I, I, do, I do have uh, a few questions for Bill. Um, Bill, I was fat, besides, thank you so much for this beautiful discussion that you've just had. You've brought out so many points that we haven't talked about before. We really appreciate that. I love when you're talking about that we feel wounded, uh, our morality and our psyche, because some of us feel that every day until we turn off the TV and don't listen to anything anymore. I just read a, a, an interesting uh, little email came over in my feed, and it said, this woman wrote that, uh, a professional woman wrote, we all have a surge capacity. And I think what she means by that, we all have a surge capacity to deal with the, a pandemic or an epidemic or crazy things happening in our life. But what we can't stand or have, having the biggest difficulty to uh, figure out is having it be go on and on and on and always 
uh, uncertain, always no, you, when you say people are asking you what to do, it's because no, we're, we're now at the end of our surge capacity and nobody's telling us what to do and we uh, have to figure it out. I think you, you've identified something that's really important, which is the other question everybody asks is when will this end? Yes. And the answer is we don't know when it will end. We know when it could end if people did the right things. We don't know when it will end. And uh, that's why everybody's so focused on a vaccine or a drug uh, that can end it. But my view is it will end ir irrespective of vaccines or drugs when we wake up and behave as we should. As we know by looking at China, you don't have to have a drug or a vaccine. It's within the human capacity to end it. Um, okay. I think the only way that you can go through knowing what this stress is, is to take every day, one day at a time. You can't do anything else. You can't say, oh, I'm going to be here in, you know, a farmhouse in Connecticut for the next four years. Well, if that's the way it is, that's the way it is. And you just take it one day at a time. I think it's the, you know, you can't, project your current situation. Uh, and the other thing I would suggest is get psychiatric help. The one thing that works via telemedicine, via virtue, the, actually the pioneers of telemedicine, Very good point. are the psychiatrists. I think reach out and get the psychiatric help you need the moment you realize you're depressed or you're too anxious. And that means your sleep pattern is altered uh, that means your perception of what your future might be is altered. I'll give you another comment that I think many people of our age would say. My friend, the same one who was the avid New Yorker, said, you know, Bill, this has taken a year out of my life, and I don't have that many years left. Right? Very common feeling amongst people our age. Right. Well, you better enjoy that year. <laughs> Because that's all we have is one day at a time, one year at a time. So well, I think that's it's not a it's not a great recipe, but I think it's the only one that we can do. And uh, if we have time later, uh, I want to comment on your comment about getting psychiatric help. But let me ask a few more questions from the audience. Um, uh, I guess this this question ultimately is: What does it take to get immune to COVID nineteen? You don't. You cannot. You don't. Yeah. There is no such thing as long-term immunity, natural long-term immunity oh, to no. coronaviruses. No. Okay. Now let me make a distinction between natural and induced immunity. Yes. Now, the way we have been successful in our vaccines in the past as to mimic what your body normally does when you're infected. You make a good immune response, you clear the virus, and you're good to go for a long time. Okay. We've never been very good at doing what your body doesn't do naturally, which is HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, herpes, where your body never really gets rid of it. We have never really figured out very much about how to do that ourselves, That's artificially. So we're now left in a quandary. Here's a virus your body gets rid of, but the virus comes right back. And it doesn't have to disguise itself like flu does. Flu comes back every year a little bit different. This guy comes back just like he was before. So it may be that a vaccine will do something our body doesn't do. But I'm less optimistic. I would give it, I'm not as pessimistic as HIV, which I said we don't, can't see one for the foreseeable future. I would say we have a 50-50 chance. We could be lucky that our vaccines will do something our bodies don't naturally do. It may be to do what this virus does, it needs a lot of its tricks. We already know this virus comes in with about 11 different tricks to fool your immune system. It's messing with your immune system and it does it actively, not passively, actively. So the vaccines presumably don't have all those capabilities. So maybe we'll be able to get a better kind of immunity with a vaccine 
than the virus naturally gives us. But it's a maybe. maybe. It's a kind of a problem we haven't solved before. And so those who are optimistic, we say we're going to have a vaccine that's very effective and very safe. That's not going to even the question of this rush to get a vaccine of unknown safety. We're not going to know how safe this vaccine that's is. What, that's okay, what, for a long time. And so you can't know. With, like, you're not going to know the year's effect of a vaccine in six months. You're not going to know the effect of what one side effect of 100,000 does when you do it to a billion people. Until you do a couple of million people. And even the manufacturing stability of for a million. Right, well, there's a whole other issue. It's like a lot of these viruses need to be kept super cold. Vaccines need to be kept super cold. And there's no cold chain in pharmacies. I, you know, one of my friends runs a big pharmacy chain. He said, we can't keep things cold like that in our pharmacy. They're going to have to give us freezers if we're going to do it. So a lot of issues. Well, that, in that case, the, maybe our final question, it looks like the end of the hour, uh, from Steve in Atlanta. Can I ask Bill if he would get the first round of the vaccine? The answer is oh, absolutely not. <laughs> Good, that's my answer. Would to... absolutely not do it. About uh, Because I'm not sure it's gonna be effective and I don't know if it's gonna be safe and I am pretty sure it won't be tested on somebody my age with my pre-existing conditions. Because like all people of my age, I have pre-existing conditions. Perfect, perfect answer. And uh, Doran and Bill, I think that we're running out of time. And I wanna thank Bill, this was super fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. Doran, you're a terrific interviewer. Thank, thank you for your questions. Um, and I want to thank the Aspen Institute for all the great work you've done over the years and for the gift you gave me when I first got involved with you through the, your leadership program. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you to our audience for the great questions and uh, for getting educated and updated on the science of brain health and COVID and the brain. Uh, thanks again to our sponsors, Lugano Diamonds and Alpine Bank. And I wanna remind everyone that this session was recorded and will be available on our website, www.aspenbraininstitute.org in just a few days. Please check our website to sign up for our next episode next Tuesday. Um, ciao everyone, ciao.